Good day, everybody, uh, wherever you are in the world, so to speak, as we're online. Welcome to another ESCO webinar on economic measurement. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sanjeev Maharjan, and I work in the economic statistics area of the UK Office for National Statistics as the head of methods and research engagement. Separately, I'm also one of the five supporting editors for the forthcoming 2025 SNA, System of National Accounts. Today's presentation is on an efficient industrial policy for innovation, standing on the shoulders of hidden giants, which is a very grand title, and I think it will be an, a good presentation. It will last for around about 40 to 45 minutes. If you have any points for clarifications, please raise them in the QA or the chat as appropriate. There will be an opportunity for questions and answers at the end. The session will be recorded and the presentation will be placed onto the ESCO website um, with the webinar series uh, that already exists there. Just a point to note, the next webinar, I know we haven't started today's, but the next webinar will be on the 23rd of February, measuring subjective well-being, evidence from the UK household longitudinal study presented by Sylvia Liu, who also is from the ONS, the Data Science Campus. More details will be available soon on the ESCO website and invitations as appropriate. So a quick intro for our guest today. Uh, Ralph Martin is an Associate Professor of Economics at Imperial College Business School. He's also the Programme Director of Growth Programme at the Centre for, for Economic Performance at the London School of Economics. And one of his most notable achievements has been putting a See a heat drum into place, which uh, is no oh, mean heat, heat pump. <laughs> so uh, as people are aware, research and development often creates knowledge spillovers, generating additional returns. This presentation is going to focus on various aspects and uh, examining the potential welfare gains of such vertical integration or in industrial policy for innovation. So thanks in advance to Ralph. And without further ado, over to you, Ralph. Off we go. Thank Thanks, Sanjeev, uh, and, and good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for uh, tuning in. Um, so this presentation, uh, as we just heard, is not working yet. Now it's working. Uh, can you see everything, I hope? So, uh, well, it, it's slightly grand a title, but, you know, as, as you might have guessed, it sort of plays on... Uh, uh, Newton's idea that, you know, the only reason we know really anything or Newton knew anything is because he was standing on the shoulders of giants. And uh, part of what we're going to tease out in, in, in this talk and in this paper it refers to is that maybe uh, we stand in part, at least, on the shoulders of hidden giants, not only obvious giants. Um, it's uh, it's uh, It's been a, a long project, this, or in a wider piece of work with, with a number of co-authors, uh, which you see here, we also had at some point a support uh, from the European Commission for that, and it was part of, of a project called Watson. Um, uh, what I wanted to think this about uh, more than, you know, the specific things we're going to be talking about today, uh, of course, I want you to think about those as well, but uh, that what, what we developed there is kind of a, a set of toolkits um, that might be useful for uh, studying innovation, studying knowledge spillovers, innovation, and studying various things related to, to R&D, innovation, and growth. Uh, and um, I mean, two key acronyms we have sort of invented, which I sort of get out of the way right away. One is called uh, P-Rank or Prank. Uh, that is a new way of measuring knowledge spillovers. And the other one is ISTRUX for Industrial Strategy Index. And hopefully by the end of this, you will know what we mean by this kind of stuff. Uh, so I think it's a, you know, while, while it is a toolkit, and so I think it's a bit of a general purpose technology. And I'll tell you in a second, you know, the various areas where we already have been applying this. And I think you can apply it to, to even a wider range of things. But uh, the original motivation came from uh, this idea of vertical industrial policy. I mean, in fact, uh, to be very precise, <laughs> I first had this idea when, when sitting in a, in a talk by Mariana Matsukatu, who, of course, has been advocating very much uh, as a mission-oriented uh, uh, approach to, you know, government support for innovation and in industrial policy. Um, but uh, the idea was more like, okay, how can we... How can we rationalize this? 
uh, and um, and I mean the key idea was that, that we should focus on knowledge spillovers. Uh, you know, we, we want to really support areas that generate more knowledge spillovers. Of course, that cannot be the only, uh, that doesn't need to be the only reason why we want to support uh, uh, industrial policy or vertical industrial policy, but it's sort of one key motivation. And if we want to do that, maybe we should look into how we can sort of measure these knowledge spillovers uh, in a sort of a practical way as well. I mean, there, there's, you know, of course, there has been a long literature on, on knowledge spillovers, but uh, one thing is also, can you do this at a sort of granularity with the data availability that would be sort of useful if you want to, uh, you know, do policy on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, so it's about how do you target this? And I said already, okay, um, it's it's a bit of a toolkit. So it's, it's certainly a toolkit for industrial policy, we would argue, uh, but, uh, you know, Part of why we got involved in this is that we were interested in climate policy, you know, with which technologies uh, should a government be supporting when it comes to uh, climate technologies. Um, in the UK, of course, never, never far, far away is the idea of regional policy. Can we uh, do something to level up uh, uh, the country? Uh, and uh, and we think uh, we can say something about that. And uh, and uh, we have a new line of research where we also look more into uh, the risk uh, preferences of R and D investors and what we are developing here. We think can can help with this kind of stuff. Um, uh, sort of a you know indeed another area is to look at geopolitical strategies because increasingly you know what. Uh, what is what is relevant here? You know, it used to be only about uh, raw materials, but increasingly these days it's also about knowledge. Where does knowledge come from? And with this kind of stuff, we can sort of study uh, the flows of knowledge in a in a in a maybe slightly new way. Um, and uh, today, however, and, and and we have sort of working papers uh, on various draft papers on on these various areas, and very happy to talk to anybody about any of this in particular, but today I want to focus a little bit more on the regional policy part and maybe the vertical industrial policy part of this. Uh, I should say this is not, the animation wasn't quite right. There's also something which, which I come to at the end, maybe if we have time, where we look into uh, stuff related to higher education policy, how you, uh, how you treat universities, which universities you might want to support, uh, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, okay. So, but at, at the at the you know the the, the raw data uh, where all of this is coming from is that we we go to the innovation data and the most comprehensive innovation data that is uh, that is of course from from patents and uh, and it you know there, there are sort of all sorts of caveats when it comes to to patent data uh, and you know and I think we we're not going to address all of them but I think we're going to address uh, some of the issues that that come with patents in particular the ones where where people say look. Uh, many different things can be a patent. Some some patents can be outright frivolous. Uh, others are maybe you know just uh, some kind of uh, uh, patent troll patent, uh, and and then there can be patents that are really very important and valuable. And and so that that's sort of where we are uh, working on. You know how can you measure a, a value better, and in particular values of of spillovers, and just to. To set the scene, here is maybe uh, one of my favorite examples of a spillover, uh, which you you know, uh, it, which you can get from patent data. And what you have there on the left, you have a uh, patent from uh, 2008, and it's a patent about audio encoding. How can you uh, store audio, such as uh, Miles Davis uh, playing the trumpet, uh, effectively on a on a computer or some kind of storage device? And they developed some algorithms that sort of makes this a uh, bit better. And uh, they cite in that, they cite a uh, patent from, from the 80s, which you see here on the right. And uh, this is a patent from a, um, that describes a wave energy power plant. So some device that you put in the ocean and it uses the movement of the waves uh, to generate electrical power. And, uh, you know, why is the side patent on the left citing the patent on the right? Well, uh, some of the ideas they developed there relied uh, in, in this audio encoding patent relied on ideas they developed with these wave energy patents. And you might say, what is the relation? Well, it turns out the wave energy guys, they needed some mathematics to, to handle the ocean waves, describe the ocean waves. And, uh, um, 
And th that mathematics that was described in that patent actually helped also with the audio waves uh, many, many years later. And this would be sort of an example of a direct uh, you know, spillover that one patent has uh, on the other, one innovation on the other. And that's what we're kind of working with. But And of course, other people have looked at this, have used citations um, of, of patents as a measure of quality and spillover. But we'd be taking this idea, uh, I would argue, a whole lot further. And in particular, you know, and, and that's where the hidden giants come, come in. And actually, the, uh, what we argue, there are hidden giants and uh, they're also illusory giants. And what you see here is a simple example of that. You have two innovations, uh, A and B. And maybe, you know, at, at, if you look at them at first, if you just look at citations, they might look very much the same. A, both A and B, they are cited just by one other innovation, like like many of our papers are only cited once or never, uh, but uh, you know here you know it's it's just an example. So in this case, uh, you might say uh, old school. Okay, they are kind of both of equal quality uh, in, if you compare them. But of course, as you see here, this innovation A uh, is is cited by an innovation which is by itself cited uh, three times in this case, whereas this one is cited by an innovation which is never again cited. So uh, what this sort of illustrates is that really, you know, if you want to use citations, you have to look at these indirect linkages as well. And from that, you might conclude that actually A is, is the better one, yeah, uh, because it has, it creates more spillovers. But of course, that could also be misleading because, uh, you know, from an economic point of, of view, at least, you know, what matters is the economic value of this. And, and maybe, you know, this is sort of indirectly or directly citing four other innovations, none of them are particularly val valuable. Yeah? So only say $100,000, uh, whereas this one, yeah, it has only one citation, but this is the $100 million uh, citation. There. So PV stands for private value here. So these are sort of, you know, things you wanna take into account when you uh, assess uh, patents and innovations in that way. And um, that idea sort of got us to uh, this formula here, which is basically the formula of what we call uh, prank uh, or patent rank. And so what is patent rank? Well, it, it's a measure of uh, what you might in an economic terms argue is the social value uh, of, of an innovation. What is the social value of an innovation? Well, it's the, the private value to the inventor uh, so that that's the value to the inventor of this innovation I, plus some kind of uh, uh, a sum over all uh, the well of all the 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 pranks of all the uh, social values of the innovation that that cite you. So these are all the innovations that cite I in uh, directly in this case. And, uh, uh, and, but we, we're not taking, you know, we're not just counting one, we're counting here how men, how, what, it, what the, the social value of those innovations J is. Um, and, uh, and of course, if we then want to calculate the value of I, uh, we first need to calculate the value of J. But, you know, uh, but, you know, we then have for J exactly the same formula. So what you have there is basically a, a system of equations and uh, and in principle, you know, you need to solve this simultaneously. The problem we have there is that we have millions, uh, millions of of innovations, and so you cannot easily solve that. But what we're relying on here really is uh, uh, stuff that that Google has developed uh, with. I mean, that that's also where the name comes from with their page rank. So this was a way uh, of for Google to assess the importance of web pages. That's why they were so much better than all their competitors at the time that they had this sort of index that sort of valued uh, uh, and ranked uh, uh, web pages in this case. And of course, in the case of web pages, it wasn't a citation, it was simply a hyperlink uh, between uh, uh, web pages. But we use sort of the same uh, kind of uh, recursive way of solving this. And we also using this idea from uh, from Google that we, um, that of course the key thing here is how do we weight this? Uh, and and, the, and I mean, you know, the general idea is that what, you know, what should this be? Well, there should be some kind of number between zero and one, you know, uh, the, the, it's kind of the fraction of your, the fraction of contribute, the, what is the contribution of innovation I to innovation J? It must be a fraction of the value that, that J generates. And um, 
And what we are using at the moment, although you know, one sort of area where we're discussing how we can extend our methods is to, to, to make this richer, to, to allow for more variation uh, and, and uh, inform this by the data as well, what this should be. But our, our starting point, our prior, is, is this basic formula here where we simply say, well, it's kind of one over uh, the backward citations of innovation J. So what does this basically mean? Well, we're making this assumption that, okay, um, what is the contribution of innovation uh, I to innovation J? Well, if innovation J cites a lot of stuff, then every the, the relative contribution of every uh, inno innovation that it cites is, is a lot smaller than if it only cites uh, you know, one or two other patents or papers. Um, so that, that, is, that is sort of what, 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 what is implicit in there. And of course, that is kind of a strong assumption, but you know, as I would argue, and I'll come back to that in a second, it's, it's a lot better <laughs> than what we have been doing uh, so far. And, uh, and so this is kind of our first uh, sort of contribution that we use this formula here. And basically it's a modification of page rank, but the key difference in terms of page rank is that we bring in here this private value of an innovation. And uh, you see the monkey here, why is the monkey there? Basically, what the private value does here by having this one in, we're moving from, a, from uh, uh, an interpretation that the, the page rank has. The interpretation of the page rank is basically, it reflects the probability distribution of across web pages that uh, a, a random surfer like my monkey here is sort of meeting uh, or hitting up on this web page by simply randomly clicking on an open browser on hyperlinks. That's what the interpretation of page rank is. And uh, you know, th this didn't make much sense to us in the context of, uh, of patents, but once you introduce the private value here of, a, of, an, uh, of an innovation, the, actually the interpretation becomes you know, uh, this sort of social value of an innovation as the sum of, um, of the private value and a fraction of the, uh, the social values of all the innovations that you cite either directly, but and also because this is again the prank, it's either you cite uh, something directly or indirectly. And, and of course, if it's, if it's further away, then, then it gets ever more discounted, but still it's, you, you assign some kind of fraction of the stuff that you, that you cite indirectly, a fraction of that value to this original innovation uh, J here. That's the basic idea. Um, okay, now, uh, and uh, you know, you, I think there are a lot of strong assumptions in 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 what I, what I'm doing there and what, what what we are doing there. I think a lot of them we can relax, but I think there is also a key insight. You know, and if you disagree with most of what I'm saying, uh, I, I would argue you might agree with this one. Uh, and it's basically, you know, what is our alternative? Our alternative is that we say, okay, you know, innovations are not the same, right? We, there is a problem in the sense that innovation, the value of innovation is very different from one innovation to the next. And our main tool here that is sort of used in, in you know, almost all papers that ever have worked with uh, uh, patents, they say, okay, let's, let's sort of quality weight those by using the citation count. So we don't just count you know, a, a one for every innovation, but if an innovation has a lot of citations, then we give them a higher count. And, you know, that is of course a nice idea, but it's also, uh, you know, I would argue an in incredibly incoherent idea because kind of on the left-hand side of this equation, you say, yes, you know, there's this, uh, there is uh, these differences in value, and that's why we need to count the citation. But then when you count on the right-hand side, it doesn't matter who is citing you, you know, whether this is sort of a superstar Nobel Prize winner, or it's just uh, James from next door who, who cites you because uh, uh, he or she knows you. Uh, and, and so it, it's an inher you know, it's, it's very incoherent to just do citation counts, and you really want to uh, or if you think values value, there are big value differences and quality differences in innovations, then you should sort of take this account on the left and the right hand side of this uh, equation that sort of calculates these value differences. And really, that is the sort of basic insight that we implementing here uh, at, at, at its core. Um, now, one sort of key aspect uh, uh, in all of this is, of course, Great, you know, this is all very nice, but what about uh, these private values? What is the private value of an innovation? And, um, you know, there, there are a couple of approaches in the literature how you uh, assess the private value. 
you know, we are not necessarily wedded to one. We are we're experimenting with others. But uh, it, what we at the moment relying on is this really nice new uh, uh, approach, which sort of was very is, has become very popular in in recent years since 2017 when it was first published by by Kogan and and co-authors. And what they're basically doing is they they're doing these event studies. Uh, on uh, stock listed firms that are patenting. Yeah? So uh, you have here an example of Amazon and uh, you know you can see it in some cases, maybe not in all cases, but the, the, what you see there is sort of small time windows of uh, you know uh, a couple of days uh, a time around the date when Amazon had uh, certain patents uh, um, uh, approved by, by the patent authorities. Uh, and and the idea is that well, if a patent is really valuable, you know, then then having this patent approved uh, should do something to the stock market of um, of a company. Of course, uh, that has its own problems because you know the stock market can be quite crazy at times, so you need to account for that. And of course, there there could be the issue that everything is already <laughs> uh, uh, reflected uh, because the, the the stock price is forward looking, and so you need to make some assumptions about uh, what investors have already expected about this. So um, uh, Kogan and and, and their co-authors they they they, they develop approach that that uh, takes account of that. Um, you know, uh, I'm sure it can be improved. And actually, we are we are working on some improvements from their approach. But this is our raw data for the private value, simply because it it gives us a value for every single innovation uh, that is being uh, put out there in in, in patent data, uh, which is not quite right. Actually, that last statement because only every every innovation that is sort of held that is applied for by a company. Uh, that is stock listed, and of course, uh, you you are probably well aware that uh, a lot of innovations are uh, are being done by companies that are not necessarily stock listed. Uh, so how do we get around this? Well, we basically use this as a kind of the, the data we get from the stock listed firm. We use this as a as a kind of training set, and we then infer uh, the the value of all patents by by putting them in, into bins according to features such as um, very detailed classification uh, of um, you know, the, the, the technologi te technological classification of innovations. You know, is this an innovation in, uh, in, in, in machine tools or as an innovation in biotechnology? And, and re really be looking at uh, detailed classes there as sort of a couple of thousand classes and so we, we assign then the value of say uh, a small company that that patents in these areas we assign the average value to their patent uh, the same value as we would assign to all the the stock listed companies that are that are that are operating in the, in, in this area and of course you know that that again requires the assumption that uh, what the stock listed companies are doing is is comparable to that what the non stock listed are, are doing um but really, you know, what we want to do here, you know, we also have to remind ourselves, you know, why are we doing this? Because we want to compare sort of big areas, right? So if, if you think about industrial policy, which, which was our motivation, it's kind of, okay, should the uh, UK government, should they support uh, aerospace or should they support biotechnology? And at that sort of level. Uh, and, I th uh, and so I, I, the, the, the hope is that... Um, that uh, at at that level, you know, the, the the big differences will capture, even though we might sort of make some sort of error at the level of of every individual innovation. Um, okay, uh, actually, we, I, I should say we, we use the technology class, but we also use a couple of other features to make this sort of inference. So we also look at the claim count of patents of a patent and also the family size. So the claim count is every innovation, if you don't know this, uh, they will make a couple of claims to novelty. You know, what is sort of novel? What is novel in my, my patent rank here? Well, not the, the formula of how to solve it. Google has done it already, but what is novel? The claim to novelty here is that, that I put in uh, the value of an innovation, you know, if I would write a patent for this. Um, and, and the family size is simply in how many uh, jurisdictions have you patented this? I mean, this is often also considered another quality indicator. You know, if 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 you're sort of a uh, slightly eccentric uh, garage inventor, you, maybe you find it cool to to patent it, and then you only go to the UK patent office if you're in the UK. You don't sort of put in all the lawyer fee to have this thing patented 
in in Japan and 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 the U.S. and everywhere else uh, because uh, you know it will be very costly for you. Uh, so that is that is another feature we're using there. Uh, now, uh, sort of another concern we had there, which is sort of particularly relevant, but it's sort of useful for a number of other things. But it's particularly relevant when it comes to uh, what you might call a national. Uh, industrial strategy. And of course, most of the time, these industrial strategies are very national. Actually, indeed, sometimes they're they are sub-national. So we we have done work on this, for instance, for the for the mayor of London, who was interested in some kind of industrial strategy uh, for London only. But the issue then becomes, you know, from, from the perspective of the UK, say, you know, you're the UK government and you're looking at applications uh, for kind, uh, technologies that, you know, one technology might sort of, you know, uh, create a lot of spillovers for people not in the UK, but but in the US. And then the people in the US, they inspire a lot of uh, innovation in, in Brazil, and the people in Brazil inspire innovation in India. And uh, these innovators in India, they might again inspire somebody, um, somebody in the UK. So now, even though, you know, the spillovers are not direct, this, you could say, is kind of a nice outcome for the UK government, giving out some R&D grants. Uh, whereas, you know, something like that, where uh, an innovator in the UK inspires somebody in Russia, who then inspires somebody in Australia, and that's it, there are no, no further spillovers, that might be less of a nice outcome for the, for the UK government. Uh, so how do we take this into account? Well, we use our formula from before, except, and then uh, apologies, because I presented this first uh, at, at the Euro European Commission. So say you are Belgium, right? And you have here a, a Belgian innovator that you might be uh, inclined to support. Um, and, and then this Belgian innovator might directly or indirectly influence others, but only some of these people down the chain are again in Belgium. Some of these inventors are only some of them are in Belgium. So how do we take this into account in our, our formula? Well, we simply only uh, allow for you know all the values we put in, uh, that are non-zero are values that are uh, uh, contained within Belgium. Any value that is not in Belgium, we sort of ignore uh, in, in the formulas you saw before. And then we calculate a new uh, patent rank and a new social value, uh, which is then the, the sort of, the so to speak, the national uh, uh, patent rank for, for Belgium. And we can do this, of course, for any other country or indeed for any say an industry, we can do this for technology areas for a region, and, and you see some results on this in a second. Uh, and and in, in particular with this one, we can also look at flows of knowledge between different jurisdictions, say to what extent uh, maybe the UK helps innovators in Belgium, you know, and the only, only thing we're doing is that uh, we then looking at uh, UK inventors up here only, whereas we only allow for values that come from Belgium still. So that's how we can look at flows. Um, okay, so while this sort of approach will give us uh, uh, an idea of the, the value, uh, the social value of different innovations and maybe the flows of, of knowledge as we, as we call it sometimes, the flows of knowledge that might happen between uh, different areas, um, this is not entirely enough to uh, to say something about industrial strategy and what now the, the government should support. Um, and, and the problem here is that, well, you know, you might see that something creates a lot, lot of uh, uh, spillovers and, and a lot of knowledge flow, they or another. But uh, of course, the government then also has to say, okay, wh what is my chance that I can inspire more of this? I want more of this, but what at what cost, right? So, uh, just as spillovers are very heterogeneous from one technology area to the next, uh, it, it, we, we all know that uh, creating one more inventive step uh, might be might be very different from one area to the next. You know, it might be very easy to create a new innovation in sort of uh, uh, app design. Yeah, you basically just need a gifted programmer who focuses on it for a for half a weekend. Whereas if you want to create the next inventive step in vaccines, uh, you need a lot more resources. You know, you need, first of all, some 
some biochemists to come up with a use, useful formula, then you need a lot of testing. Even once you have the testing, you need to do more testing on uh, first on animals, maybe then on, on humans. And, and, and you need to go through all sorts of hoops of a, a, approval before you have something that resembles an innovation that you might be able to patent uh, and, and uh, make money with. So how do we account for this? Uh, and of course, you know, you know, you might say, well, you need to get data on on R and D investments, and uh, and that would be very nice to have. Um, and sometimes, you know, we have uh, you. I mean, some of you are at uh, the ONS and other statistical offices. Obviously, you're collecting some data on R and D spending by um, by companies. But of course, compared to what we have at the level of innovation outcomes. Uh, data is much harder to get and much less comprehensive than what we have at the outcome level. So what we what we started thinking about is sort of a way of uh, you know of of helping us there and 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 uh, plugging that 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 gap. And so the idea here is that rather than relying on on um, some external data, we might be able to infer at some of this at least sort of the big sort of uh, differences that it might exist between different areas. From the from the patent data that we're already using there and uh, and the value data that I've showed you already and what we're doing there is that we're developing a, a simple model of the R and D um, uh, creation process uh, or the innovation uh, creation process I, I should say and you see it sort of illustrated here that the basic idea is that uh, there there are inventors and every every day they have a lot of ideas. And uh, you know the, the, there is a certain quality distribution across these ideas. Yeah, if you're like me, you know I might have a lot of ideas, but a lot of them are, are, are pretty bad. And only occasionally I have a sort of slightly better idea. And uh, and of course, and I, having an idea, you know, ideas. Uh, there's no shortage of ideas. But then uh, to really turn an idea into an innovation, you need to put down some some effort. You need to invest some some R and D. And that that creates a hurdle, uh, and uh, this hurdle, how big that hurdle is, will differ from technology area to technology area. So really, what we want to infer is this sort of these these hurdle hurdles. How big are these hurdles, and are they much bigger, say, in biotechnology than they are in uh, semiconductors or something like that? And so, and then sort of the next step is you now even if you if you put down this R and D investment, if if you decided okay, this looks like a good idea, there's no guarantee that this happens. So we have sort of an, an, another process where an idea can succeed or fail. Uh, and, um, and with this, we can write down basically a, a, a theoretical distribution of the values we should observe in, uh, in, 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 in our data of, of private values as we get them from COVID. And you see the formula here. Uh, I, I you know I don't have uh, time to go into detail into the formula, but basically you have the sort of expression here of of how how that uh, distribution should look based on our our simple model. And and there are two key parameters that emerge out of this. One is C, which is the sort of cost that might vary from one technology area to another technology area. And then there will be a, a an, an alpha. An alpha reflects uh, the sort of underlying idea generation. Uh, function. So, you know, it, it, there's no guarantee that the, the sort of how ideas emerge, it's the same from all areas. Maybe there are some areas where the likelihood that you have superstar ideas is, is much higher, uh, uh, whereas another area, it's much more left skewed. And, and basically, there is a vast number of ideas, but the value of all of them or the expected value is, is nearly always uh, very close to zero. So that sort of that sort of curvature uh, uh, of, of that distribution that's sort of captured by this parameter alpha. And then what are we doing with this? Well, we take this idea to, to or the, this sort of theoretical distribution uh, to the data. And here you see um, uh, a number of cases of, of how, how these uh, uh, distributions might vary. So you basically get this kink here. Uh, and the kink is sort of where the kink starts that's driven by this cost. So the higher the cost is, the more to the right the kink will occur, and um, and then you have the sort of curvature and sort of you know as I said you might have an idea generation function which has more weight on the on the crappy low value ideas or one which has more weight on the uh, on the on the high value ideas, and so we take then the, these sort of 
uh, theoretical models to actual data. And here you see two examples. Uh, and, uh, and we might sort of debate how well how well that that works, but that's what we're doing at the moment. I'm sure this can be improved, but you see we're doing, doing this at great detail. So this would be a 61k, which you see here that would be preparations for medical, dental or toilet purposes. Yeah, so this is a very detailed technology classification. Here you have electrical digital data processing on the right. Or if you want to have a couple of more examples that come here. So we have here semiconductors and here we have organic fine chemistry. And you see already, you know, as semiconductors, it would seem are a bit less costly uh, to come up with an uh, innovation, whereas in organic fine chemistry, it might be a bit more. Um, okay. Um, now with, once we have this, uh, the, uh, so one sort of key result in the data, again, I don't want to bore you with this formula, but basically what we show then is we can calculate this thing which we call I-Strux. And it's really this sort of thought experiment that, uh, okay, what would be the return? Take two areas, take semiconductors and fine chemistry. If we give grants in these areas as the government uh, and we, you know, we say, okay, what, what about if I uh, increase uh, the grant size I'm giving to semiconductors a little bit uh, versus what I tend to give uh, uh, organic fine chemistry. What kind of uh, return uh, would I have in terms of uh, government money spent? And return then being, okay, if I give this, you know, the, the, the inventor who gets this uh, will, uh, will be very happy. But then also it depends on what kind of spillover is this inventor most likely gonna inspire? And, uh, and so that, that's how we get the sort of social return for the government out of this. And uh, what we show there, what we show in the paper is how you can work that out based on the data you have available, which sort of involves, you know, as I said, the alpha and the C, which we discussed, but then we can infer this from various moments uh, of, of the sort of uh, uh, private value and social value. So EV is the external value that an individual innovation is, is generating based on our prank measure. So we, we show there how we can infer this sort of ISTREX index, which has this interpretation. Okay, if I give a little bit more money to one area, what is the sort of return in sort of percent uh, for the government? I mean, do they make a return of 1% or is it 100%? Um, and we're gonna see in a second, I show you average values uh, across various areas of precisely that. Um, now, uh, starting to look at more at, at actual results from this. Uh, so what you see there is a simple uh, tabulation of, um, uh, well, on the one hand, we get here EV, the external value that we get out of, out of our prank measure, and we compare this to uh, you know, the, the next best competitor, which is simply counting citations, which people have done before. And then we look, okay, where do individual innovations uh, fall? And, and what we see there is that, um, well, we see, you know, that, that there, is a, uh, there is a line where how we rank innovations by, by forward citations is very similar to how we rank them uh, by this new external value prank measure. But there are important deviations. So for, for this particular figure, we bin everything into, into D size. And, uh, and basically we get these two areas. You can either be much more highly ranked based on, on prank than you are on uh, forward citations, or you can be less highly ranked based on uh, uh, prank uh, than you are on forward citations. And uh, this area up here where you're more highly ranked based on prank, that is the area of the hidden giant. Yeah, Something where we look into these sort of indirect linkages and also the value, we rank you much higher than you know, we would have ranked you based on sort of Newton's idea, well, have you been cited a lot? Uh, and, uh, and then down here, we have the illusory giants. And here we have to sort of, you know, you might call these real giants, uh, innovations that are being cited a lot, but then also the, um, the, the prank measure puts you at the same, same kind of count. And, um, if we sort of, uh, uh, you know, just look where is most of the, where do most of the spillovers come from? Uh, and it, it's very clear that, uh, mo so the, the, the area of these bars, so the, uh, the, uh, the, the height of these bars 
is simply um, uh, the average external value. Uh, the width of these bars is how many innovations are in this category. And so the area is the total value of, of these innovations. And what we find there is that basically more than half uh, in terms of total value of innovations are in this sort of category of hidden giants. So that's sort of our justification of saying, well, actually, uh, you know, really be standing on the shoulders of hidden giants. Um, oops, I'm going backwards for some reason. Okay. Once we once we calculate this sort of one thing uh, we find at least very interesting, and I think it's 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 really could be an interesting measure to to even study you know how well are governments doing in terms of industrial policy, but it's to to compare this from one country to the next, and of course it's very clear that a, you know a bigger country will have more of this, but what we're looking at here is sort of the per capita. Uh, external value that is being generated by different countries. And you see it varies a lot. You know, it goes here from uh, 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 40,000 uh, per, per person in the country in Korea to, you know, uh, Portugal is not so great or, uh, um, I mean, the, the UK doesn't, um, looks a lot worse than, than say, uh, uh, Korea. Um, so that, that is sort of one aspect. The other aspect is then this sort of national versus versus global thing. So what you see here is the, the, the global figures, but then the blue part is how much of that is internalized within the country. And and uh, and on here, the what this uh, black line shows you, it shows you what fraction. So you have to see here on the right hand side, we have the share that is internalized. And here we have the, the, the average value in terms of millions. And and what of dollars and what you see there is well so in most countries you know except maybe for Korea really uh, more than half of the external value that is generated by innovators within the country tends to go uh, abroad and it's not entirely surprising but you know it, it's nice to see this and it's also uh, nice to see how that varies yeah so in I mean as I said in Korea it's it's actually more than half is some, somehow internalized uh, you know. It's still quite a lot in, in a country like Japan. It's also quite a lot in the US, even though it's less than half, but then it's a lot less in, in, a, in a country like Britain. And of course, part of this is size, but you know, I mean, Korea is, is not the biggest country here. Still, they manage to internalize more. So I, I mean, at this point, we don't have a strong value judgment, but I think this is just an interesting stylized fact to, to keep in mind. And also, I mean, uh, this is now just a snapshot. Uh, of uh, of the most recent period we had available for the study. But of course, it, it could be very interesting to study these kind of things over time, uh, you know, as, as governments uh, are, are trying to do something, I mean, uh, you know, in, in terms of industrial policy. Okay, uh, but sort of the key motivation here was to look at, uh, at different areas. So you can play the same game we played with countries, you can play them Played across different technology areas, and this is now for the the, the world as a whole. All the all the patents we had for, uh, in our data, which I, I should have said is actually from from Patstat, which many of you will be familiar with. So Patstat is the most comprehensive uh, assembly of of innovation data for most patent offices from around the world. And uh, if we use that, you know, we find. I mean, the first sort of question you might be asking from an industrial strategy point of view, okay. What is is does it make sense to vertically differentiate? Is there one technology area that is very different from another? And uh, first, the first figure you see here is the the patent rank, so simply the external value. And the answer is uh, yes. There are big differences. You have something like organic fine chemistry, pharmaceuticals up here, uh, where you have uh, the average value of an innovation uh, measured in this way. The social value is two point five million, where you have you know. Uh, mechanical elements it's it's only uh half a million yeah so so uh, uh, a big difference and also you might say well yeah this is the average you see the arrow bars here this is this is pretty uniform uh across uh different uh different innovations in these fields but then as i've been arguing well okay you know external value is one thing that doesn't really tell us uh, if the if it's sensible for the government to to try and 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 uh, go by this and uh, maybe target their support for this, but here we use ISTREX, this measure of the return uh, uh, for uh, for government spending for a particular area, and and you see that again you see, you have big differences here from one technology area to the next. 
Now, what we have is not millions, but it's basically um, re return in percentages. So down here, uh, mechanical elements, you know, again, mechanical elements is not doing too well, uh, th but they would get a, you know, we would sort of assign a return of say, maybe 10% uh, for every, every government dollar spent here. Whereas for something like wireless, optics, audiovisual technology, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's more than 50%, uh, uh, um, more than 50% return. And, um, and but, but, so in, the interesting point to note is there's a big difference between different technology areas. Uh, and this sort of is a significant uh, uh, difference. And, and also in terms of the ranking, it's, it's a very different ranking, right? So we have wireless up here, whereas here we had organic fine, fine chemistry. I'm, I'm very pleased given that I'm interested in, in, in clean energy and, and these kind of things, clean energy comes fairly high up here as you know, not something which would be great to have from, a, from a, a, a preventing climate change point of view, but simply if you're interested in, uh, in say, um, uh, improving growth, uh, and and doing good uh, uh, vertical industrial policy, yeah. Then then you might also consider supporting uh, clean energy because it comes fairly high up. The one thing to note: this is now the world as a whole average across the whole world. Once you break this down by different countries, the rankings change again by country very much. So uh, you know, if you are particularly interested in one particular country, I can give you the figures for that. And in the paper, you will see a, a lot more figures. Uh, just to illustrate that, let me uh, let me now move to uh, these kind of figures. And actually, these kind of figures we have been uh, uh, working with uh, uh, last year and the year before with uh, people at base. So the, for those of you who are not in the UK, that is sort of the UK Department for Business. Uh, and and energy um, and they uh, they were interested in particular in different uh, clean technologies. So the, there was a portfolio the the government wanted to support, uh, or there was a budget to support clean technology development. Uh, and uh, you know the, of course there are sort of certain criteria of what would be really cool to have in terms of uh, uh, maybe uh, preventing climate change, but would be a good technology. What is a technology that needs more development? But the question here was okay, what can we support? Uh, and uh, what would, would be good from uh, creating knowledge spillovers within the UK? Um, and, uh, or, or rather, but we're comparing here really is on the left-hand side, we're looking at uh, the global social return by UK innovators uh, across a range of different areas. First of all, you see in green, different um, uh, clean technology areas. And uh, these were defined by, uh, uh, basically what uh, what Bayes was interested in. I mean, also the, the detailed classification, which I can share with you if you're interested, you know, but this is all by uh, very detailed uh, IPC uh, patent technology classes. And then we were also interested in comparing this to other, sometimes we call them trending or, you know, sexy technologies that uh, that people are often talking about, wireless, artificial intelligence, biotechnology. Um, and, and again, the width of these bars is how many of those uh, are in the UK, uh, and, and then the height of the bar is the average uh, social return. Uh, so here we see, you know, returns of over 100% for, for wireless, uh, and then, uh, uh, and, you know, certain technology classes, you know, clean technology classes have only 40% return, uh, or only, I mean, 40% return is actually not bad if you can invest in something like that. Uh, um, and, uh, but the others are a lot higher. So there's a big heterogeneity here. Yeah, solar would be a lot higher, offshore wind than say nuclear uh, uh, or CCUS. Uh, and, um, but of course, while this might be interesting, the global social return is not necessarily what the UK government is worrying about, especially as they as they Brexiting and become more insular. So they might be more uh, worried about the UK social return. And that's what you see on the right hand side. So the first thing to note, of course, is that uh, the potential return is a lot lower because, you know, you only count as something to be valuable if, if it helps some kind of UK inventor. So, you know, whereas here we go from, uh, you know, 80% return, over 100% return, we only go to 4%, 6%, 8%. But again, you have a big variation here. 
uh, you you know, and 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 again, the, the ranking changes. Yeah, so we have solar here simply because you know solar is is pretty pretty you know uh, uh, global. Uh, everybody is doing solar, but maybe uh, things like tidal stream is uh, uh, actually, actually actually turns out tidal stream. There's really seems to be a, a cluster in the UK where where people are doing this and seem to be very good in that. And not only that, it seems really that um, that uh, investing in that part would also create a lot of spillovers within the UK, not necessarily only in tidal stream. Yeah, so this might be tidal stream technology helping the shipbuilding industry or, or some other sort of very indirect linkage. Uh, and so the same is true for offshore wind. Actually, it turns out from a from a national point of view, forget about climate change, tidal stream and offshore wind would seem the, the, the highest return thing the UK government can do, higher than even than wireless or, or artificial intelligence. Because, of course, why is that? You know, yes, artificial intelligence, everything, but he thinks it's cool. But if the UK government invests in that, chances are, you know, uh, some inventor in Silicon Valley uh, is going to benefit from that more so than than somebody else in the in the UK. OK, um, that's one thing. Um, uh, what about I was talking about regional policy? So we can now play this game uh, where we where we not only look you know, for the UK as a whole and what is being internalized within the UK, but what is what are the flows around the UK uh, between different uh, parts uh, of the UK? Um, and um, and uh, what, what you see here is uh, what is sometimes called in the UK the golden tri triangle. And on the on the left, you see, okay, if it would treat outside the golden, so golden triangle is London, Oxford, and Cambridge, yeah. And so that's where you have a lot of wealth in the UK. That's where you have a lot of innovation in the UK, and it's much lower everywhere else. Uh, and what you see there is that, you know, if you um, if you only look uh, for the golden triangle on the left hand side, here you see what. Uh, what the different technology areas that you would want to support there. And, uh, and it turns out that, you know, in Oxford, London, Cambridge, we're doing a lot of the trending stuff. And so if you support, if the UK government wants to support something there, the trending stuff might help. However, what we see on the right hand side is sort of the, the flows of knowledge you have to uh, outside the golden triangle. So that would be an idea. What should the UK government support within the golden triangle that would really help people outside the golden triangle? And but you see that that it's mainly um, what well, the top category here is actually clean innovation. That is the top category uh, that they could support. And what you see here as well is the sort of uh, average line of uh, the returns you would get if the UK government or anybody else for that matter would just support uh, people outside the golden triangle in the in the lagging regions. And an interesting result there is that supporting clean energy in Oxford and London and Cambridge will help uh, those lagging regions more, generate more returns in those lagging regions than supporting the average technology in the lagging regions. Uh, and, and, and the reason for that we think is that, well, you know, yes, you know, if you support somebody in a lagging region, it's great, you know, the, the person that gets the support uh, will be very happy, but because uh, the innovators in the lagging regions are maybe not total superstar inventors as with, with the ones you will find in Oxford and London and Cambridge. The, the, the spillover it generates for their own regions is much lower than if you support the right technologies in the leading regions. Uh, so, you right. know, yes. Just to I say you've got a couple of minutes because okay, we, we want to leave a few minutes. So let's, 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 jump, let's jump to a bit of a conclusion or let's, let's highlight some things and then we can have a discussion about this. So part of the reason why the clean technologies are very good, you see here is that uh, various sort of Oxford and London and Cambridge have a lot of the total innovation and a lot of say, you know, uh, innovation like biotechnology, clean innovation seems to be much more evenly spread around the UK. Um, uh, so since I don't have much time, let me not get too much into that, but sort of one sort of key aspect where, that we are thinking about at the moment is well, all of this, as you have seen, we have we have seen that a lot of the spillovers flow outside your own country, and we saw we saw that there are these big differences in uh, in the returns you're getting from uh, different areas. So there are two implications from that. There is a benefit from targeting, and here we're trying to work out, you know, what are the likely 
benefits. And we find that targeting versus non-targeting, it you know, depends a bit on the country, but you, you get benefits of that are 80% higher or even 100% higher or more than 100% higher than if you wouldn't target. Uh, that, that is one thing here. The other thing is coordination. If most of our spillovers flow outside, uh, then there's a strong benefit of coordinating industrial policy at sort of supranational level of the EU or G7 or the OECD. And again, we have some policy simulations where we're trying to work out the benefit of that. And you see here sort of benefits of 25% uh, higher returns. And there's a bit of a, a difference whether you say, well, you know, we, we just support the innovators wherever they are, or we want to, in doing so, we want to be somewhat equitable between different countries. When the point being with the, the tools we are developing here, you can get some figures on this uh, uh, and supporting that sort of debate. Okay, uh, just a final shout out. Um, one of the extensions we're currently working on is that we are not only looking at patent data, we're now extending our knowledge graph, so to speak, from only patents and spillovers within patents to also the academic literature. And the idea is then that we can sort of assess how sort of academic literature directly or indirectly eventually feeds into patents that are being, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, applied for and granted by, by, by private companies. And then this, you know, there are a lot of things you can do with this. One sort of funny thing is to look at ranking different universities in terms of, of how well they're doing. I'm pleased to say that, uh, you know, the Imperial College is at least in the top uh, 10 or something like that. But of course, there are institutions that are doing a lot better along these measure, which of course is not to suggest that the only thing the university is doing is creating uh, uh, you know, stuff that some company can later patent and sell. But of course, it's, it's at least one metric that we might wanna consider. And it's, I think it's also potentially, I mean, as you might know, uh, there has been a big literature looking into universities and what is their contribution. A lot of this is very localized. You know, is, is Cambridge creating jobs near Cambridge? But of course, you know, the important thing might be the important contribution of Cambridge is not necessarily creating jobs near Cambridge, but creating knowledge worldwide. And this is a way of assessing this better potentially. Okay, let me let me summarize. We have a new toolkit uh, with a wide range of applications, uh, hopefully and some key results. Uh, the returns to R&D subsidies, they vary widely between fields. And uh, this is very country and region specific. Um, for the UK, we found these results that uh, clean technology in particular, uh, ocean and, and, uh, and, and tidal stuff uh, could be uh, creating, you know, not, not only help address climate change, but also could be part of a, of a, a vertical growth strategy. Uh, and uh, and not only that, it would also benefit um, uh, leveling up. Uh, and uh, generally speaking, there are substantial benefits from targeting, if you can work it out how, and and, and policy coordination. Okay, so that was a lot of stuff. Uh, hopefully, we have still some time to discuss. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Ralph. Um... I think you're right. You covered a lot of stuff there. You're very passionate and you can see there's a lot of detailed material there. I've got a couple of questions about Chairman's prerogative. I'll park, park to one side. Um, there is a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, I want to bring in Rachel Solovici. Uh, Rachel, how are Hi. you? Hi. Hi. Um, I actually came up with a much better question while I was listening to this great talk. I'm so cool. It's so cool how you do the national spillovers. Have you ever done with in company spillovers? Because that might be what a CEO is most concerned about. Um, we haven't done it yet, but I, I'm, I'm totally interested in, and we were thinking it, it could be a nice tool also to, well, to, to do within company, but also to assess mergers ex post and ex ante, right? You could say, well, which are the companies we, if we merged, we would solve a lot of the, uh, you know, uh, we, we, or we would, would have more internalization uh, and, and yeah, do it at that level. Uh, totally. I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good point. Okay, thanks for that, Ralph. There's a comment from Leo, and I'm going to seek apologies in advance of the pronunciation. Sefe Korkas, he's basically com complimenting you and your uh, work that's done, you and the authors. Um, whilst if anyone else has any questions, please use the chat ASAP. We've got a few minutes, we'll utilize, but I've got a couple of for yourself, Ralph. Um, obviously, I mean, I love it when mathematics 
comes into it because mathematics has uh, been at the core of many inventions uh, throughout history. However, um, coming to the link between cap market capitalization and the investment in the R&D and the spillover, have you considered the link to GVA or more importantly, the sales, the capital income streams that are generated is one aspect. Um, I agree with Rachel about the, it within business and outside the business, whether it's national or global, there's a lot of opportunities there. And then in your social value, which is obviously really subjective and really difficult to measure, it's a big challenge. Um, have you considered areas where the invention is valued at something, but all the citations are valued a lot more than the original invention? And how do you deal with that? A few yes, so I, I didn't fully understand the last thing. You mean the... the, the um... So when you have the invention plus the sum of the citations, what happens? In or which, the, the, the relative size of them. Yeah. Um, well, I think it, it, it varies a lot. Um, uh, I don't have a good... A statistic to show you, but but I, I agree it, it it could be interesting to to compare the two. Uh, you know what there are areas where one is higher, one is lower. What what is the relationship between it? Um, I, I I agree. <laughs> it's an interesting yes. thing to look at, but I don't have a, a nice and nice then the link in the utilization market capitalization versus say something. Oh yeah, that is revenue, um, revenues so, profits. Well, I think I think. Um, we haven't systematically done it yet, but uh, you know, uh, I think the, the the key insight is: look, uh, this is one thing you can stick in there, but maybe you want to stick other things in there that you can uh, estimate reasonably. You know, uh, it, it's just often hard to uh, ascribe something to an individual innovation. I mean, this is the beauty of the. I mean, a lot of people would sort of <laughs> question how well they're doing it, but this Kogan method that it at least assigns something to an individual innovation. Actually, one thing we're just working on, so we're having a, a, a big new general research theme where we're trying to link, uh, I mean, it's basically about the clean transition and, and labor markets and these kind of things. So uh, one thing we're trying to see there, you know, okay, you have a company that that is sort of, uh, uh, say, you, you know, especially when it comes to this regional policy stuff, right? So it's great, you know, that there is an inventor up in the in the in the lowlands outside the Golden Triangle that that is doing um, in, in innovating in clean. But you know, to 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 really say this is really doing leveling up, <laughs> you have to somehow take, make the bridge to this is not only some inventor sitting in a garage <laughs> by by herself you know, pretty isolated, but this is a company that is, as a consequence of that, generating a lot of jobs in the area. So one thing we're trying to do is figure out, you know, who are these companies, what are the jobs, and and embed then some kind of metric into, will, will this, you know, so to speak, especially in the UK context, all of this stuff, does this benefit the average Brexit, Brexit voter in, in the street in Sheffield? <laughs> Just a... Uh... Uh, hopefully not just a Brexit voter as well. Hopefully, um, yes. Uh, hopefully. There's another question. It's on a similar sort of theme to what you ended up is from, from Niles Handler. If you Niels, want, Niels. I'll unmute you in a moment if you want to ask your question. Excellent. Yeah, uh, Ralph, great presentation. I was just wondering sort of what's the role of uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem and how would you measure them for uh, this type of innovation? Thanks. Well, I, I would argue what's driving our result is in part the entrepreneurial ecosystem. I mean, for instance, if you look at the um, uh, the results on, on on clean innovation, that is, you know, the fact that uh, the, you know the fact that why is it that uh, supporting clean innovations in London helps the rest of the UK? But it's part of an ecosystem we have here. We actually have a, a, a around the country there seem to be a lot of innovators that are working in one clean category or another, uh, or, or at least we have innovators that are benefiting from that. Yeah, even if they're not necessarily clean innovators themselves. So that, that is a reflection of that ecosystem. Uh, so I think it, it's just a neat way of taking to uh, taking this stuff into account. Okay, thanks for that, Niles. Um, Ralph, last question um, from Prashant Garg. Uh, we'll unmute you if you come on oh, in a moment. Of course. <laughs> oh, I see. Right. They should okay. be asking you tricky questions then. So Prashant. Okay. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, um, it would be interesting to see how external value of 
different tech areas vary over time because uh, the hidden, hidden giants would be based on the past uh, citations, right? And we may want to understand who will be the hidden giants of the future. So is there a way we can predict who, what the hidden giants would be for the future so we can do something about it? Well, you know, yeah, yeah, you're, you're hitting the, the nail. But uh, so what I showed you is sort of I sort of an implicit assumption I was making if I say, oh, you know, which area should you support? I'm, I'm making precisely this assumption that, well, in the past uh, 20 years, that's how it was, you know, spillovers, especially from clean flew to the, the rest of the UK. How do I know that this is going to carry on in the next 10 years? Um, well, I can't be sure, but uh, it's at least a good guess. And, and if you go to the paper, one new figure we have, so I showed you this figure of, um, of uh, you know, how much higher would your return be if you target it as opposed to not targeting? Or how much higher would it be if you coordinate it as opposed to not coordinating? And the figure I showed you was entirely based on assuming that there's a one-to-one -one mapping between what happened in the last 10 years about you know, what happens when you start targeting now. But uh, we also have a figure where we see, um, well, if we would have uh, 20 years ago targeted for the next 10 years, how well would we have done? And of course, you can't do quite as well, but you can, it's still sort of higher, yeah? it, it helps. So that, that, I think that is, that is our approach. You know, let's, 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 let's let the data speak. You know, and, and this might vary from area to area. We have a, this, these kind of indicators uh, might be more or less predictive of, of the structure in the future. Uh, but, you know, we have a long enough time series to at least have a sort of an informed uh, discussion about that. Okay, thank you very much, Ralph. Um, we'll draw a line here. So thank you, Ralph, and your colleagues for the paper and presentation. Um, and the next presentation of the webinar series will be on the 23rd of this month, just to mention that again, uh, whilst colleagues are on. Okay, so thank you very much. Have a good rest of the day, and au revoir. Thank you. Au revoir. Ciao, ciao.